That's fair enough. Uh, now, you also mentioned uh, shearing and different oils that can be used in, in a gearbox application. Mm -hmm. Talk about uh, using like an engine oil versus like a, a, in my car, I use Redline MT90 just mm -hmm. as an example. Uh, so something that's like a GL4 specific for manual transmissions. Um, Hang on to that GL4. We're, we're going to come back to that. Okay. All right. So back to what we were saying about the mini straight cut gear. So in a transmission, that has synchronizers, straight cut gears, the engine oil additive package is better for everything in the transmission than a GL5 type gear oil package. Okay. Because a GL5 gear oil package is all about extreme pressure. Very little anti wear. Okay. So with the Redline MT90 actually has ZDP and things like that in it. In fact, you can have it analyze and see. Okay. If it doesn't have zinc and phosphorus in it, it's not going to be a lot of air wear protection. Okay. And you do need calcium or magnesium detergents in there to help protect the synchronizers. Because that stuff actually works really good. Those detergents work good at keeping the synchronizers clean. That way it shifts well. I see. So GL4 would be appropriate. GL5, leave it on the shelf. Right. So here's the thing about GL4 or GL5. The old test to pass a gear oil as GL4 no longer exists. So in the API specification for gear oils, a GL4 is just a GL5 gear oil package at 50% treat rate. Oh, interesting. So back to your engine oils, where it's API, SJ, SL, SM, SN. Well, when you see it, when it says GL4 slash GL5, it's a GL5. I see. They're saying it will work as a GL4 because it has that same additive package, it just has more of it. Right. But that if it says GL4 slash GL5 does not mean it will perform the same in a straight cut gearbox as something that's GL4 only. Okay. Now, what about the helical cut gears, though? Most gearboxes aren't uh, in these anyway aren't straight cut. As long as it's, it's on an angle. It's okay. It's when it goes to a hypoid, kind of 90 degree drive. So even a helical gear is actually that line of contact is pure rolling still. Okay. It's not the same. There's a little more axial thrust there with the helical gut gear, but it acts the kind of the same. So that would explain, uh, I talked to a, somebody from Redline a while back, mm -hmm. and they were saying in a gearbox use GL4, but in the differential, they recommended GL5. That's why. Presumably because it's a higher offset. Mm -hmm. And so you've, you've got more pressure, and that's where the extreme pressure additives become more important. Right. And they, they're a great company because they've been around for a long time, right. and they do things well. And, they, and they, they, they go by the spirit and intent of the rules of the API things. So when they say they have an oil that's just a GL4, it's because that's for a transmission. And they're using chemistry put together that will provide the proper protection for those gears and those synchronizers, whether they're saying, yeah, use that, GL4, transmission. GL5 for the differential, because that's different. Got it, so, so when I say in my videos that I've used MT90 and pretty much all of the classics for the, mm -hmm. for the gearbox, I'm, I'm saying use gear oil, but it has to be a specific gear oil, not just go to your local AutoZone or your Napa. And, and, and get some 7590, because that's right. gonna be a GL5. Right. Right, so you've got to be careful about which one you're using. Now, is there a difference? Because MT90 really isn't technically a gear oil. Well, that's interesting. No, it's a transmission fluid. Okay, I see. It's just not an ATF. That's the thing. We've got nomenclature where we think transmission fluid is ATF. Well, it's a gearbox. It's still a transmission. Right. That is a transmission fluid. It's just not an automatic 
transmission fluid. Is there a difference between like a, a, a specific manual transmission fluid versus an engine oil in a gearbox? The shop manual in, in the TR6s said use 90 weight oil, I think, but a lot of the MGs, the Austin Healy, it says engine oil. And is there a reason that you would use one versus the other? The same thing you talked about with the red lines example. So the MT90 is a GL4. It's a different additive package than the MT90. Well, they said in the old days, they knew what we were talking about. Engine oil had the right additive, so use this straight 30 engine oil with the correct additives in it for that. But in your differential in the back, now you put in the gear oil. So that the shop manual wouldn't say use a transmission oil because they really didn't have that. No. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. It's one of those things that developed over time, right? That as time progressed, now they started to get, uh, back today, you can get a car today that has a dual clutch transmission. Mm -hmm. That dual clutch transmission, that fluid is closer to an engine oil than it is a rear gear oil, a differential fluid. I see. Same thing. It would be something that would probably be fairly appropriate. I wouldn't do it, uh, right? But it'd be closer to what they were saying in the old owner's manual about here. This is what you need to put in this transmission is that because the dual clutch transmission is just that it's wet clutches inside straight cut gearbox it just happens to have two of them and the computer's controlling it so i say put mt90 in a gearbox and i'm right so yes i never hear that from my wife so this you've you've heard it it's on the <laughs> internet it's got to be true i'm yes. right about something for once in my life uh let's talk about viscosity a little bit mm -hmm. so you mentioned 1040 earlier so it made me think to ask this question uh, a lot of these the classic cars, they have 2050 is what's spec'd in the shop manual. Mm -hmm. um, could you use, should you use a 1040? Has the thinking on that evolved over time? Well, the problem is with, say, a 1040, for example, or say a 550 or a 1060, because there's lots of oils available today. Those wide split multi grades tend to shear and lose viscosity easier. Not all of them will but most of them do. That's the tendency of that wide split multi-grade. So really an older car like this, the 2050 is the better way. I wouldn't look at going to a 10W40 uh, because typically what's gonna happen is it's gonna shear more uh, mechanically. Okay. But, but a 15W40 might work depending upon the environment you're in. So you just want the gap kind of closer between those numbers right. as, as a percentage, mm -hmm. and, and then it'll it'll sort of outlast it and, and be a better oil. Yeah. So if you're in a hot climate, it's easier to get away with 2050 because you're not going to be most of these cars aren't being driven in the winter anyway. Right. Um, so more than likely, but I'll say this: if you have a car and you're say you're running 2050 in it, and it's running a little bit hot you could try a 15w40 because viscosity is a fancy word for resistance to flow and the higher the viscosity the more heat it's going to generate in the engine we've seen in the engine where you drop one viscosity grade like that just from 20 to 1540 in the water temperature and the oil temperature both go down how do you know if your oil so we, we talked about this a little bit but how do you know if your oil is doing its job i mean presumably you'd send it for testing yeah uh, so and how back to the testing or trusting right if you're not testing you're just trusting how often should you do that for these kind of cars because they don't usually get a ton of miles on them per year what i suggest is at the end of the year before the car goes away for winter storage change the oil when you do that annual oil change if you don't drive the car more than a few thousand miles a year Right. Once a year is probably going to be enough. You should you. drive it a few thousand miles a year. It's, it's a good thing to do, yes. If it takes you 10 years to drive a few thousand miles, you're doing it wrong. Right, yeah. Go, drive the car when the weather's nice. Get out there, drive the car, enjoy it. That's what it's there for. Um, but when you put the car away for the winter, go ahead, change the oil. At that time, take the sample, send it off. And then you get the information back. And what happens is over years you develop a trend and you'll actually see what's going on and then even if you on the very first sample if you see something that's out of line you can begin to adjust what you're doing maybe viscosity or additives or whatever is going on but over time you'll see what's happening uh, usually what really gets the oil in trouble isn't anything the oil can do by itself 
It's fuel dilution, environmental contamination. Those are the things. I mean, the way to determine oil life is actually the oil to fuel ratio. So I see most modern cars that have an oil life indicator, they're using some sort of knowledge of how much fuel is going through the engine. They know how much oil the engine takes and they're using that to determine how long the oil lasts. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, fuel is the number one enemy of your oil. So what we see a lot with classic cars is that the fuel quality in the U.S. isn't great in terms of detergency. And when you have older carburetors and stuff, it's very easy with today's ethanol blended fuels for the carburetors to basically begin to get some deposits in there. And now the fuel metering and really it's the atomization of the fuel becomes poor. And when you have poor atomization, that leads to poor vaporization. If you don't have vaporization, the fuel can't burn. So if you've got just droplets of fuel in the combustion chamber, they won't burn completely. That unburnt fuel gets into the oil That's and begins, the oil. and that lowers the viscosity. It basically begins to break down the oil faster. That's what leads to shorter oil life uh, at higher engine wear. So we typically find with oil analysis is here, put some detergent additive in your fuel, get your carburetor cleaned up. It cleans the carburetor up and all of a sudden now my fuel dilution goes down, my viscosity goes back up, and my engine wear goes back down. So that's the number of things I'm learning like, something. It's here. just like typically, we mentioned lots of different brands of oil. The reality is it's not about the brand. Typically, yeah. it, it, what we see mostly is fuel problems, short trip driving, like you mentioned earlier. If it takes you right. 10 years to get a thousand miles in the car, you're doing it wrong because you're probably not driving the car long enough and you're building up moisture in the engine, which is going to lead to rust and other corrosion issues in it. So don't start the car once a week or every couple months during winter storage. Put it away, just let it sit. It's going to be fine. Just put it away with fresh oil. Right. You know, and then spring hits and get behind the wheel and drive it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, that's the best way to do it. And when you do the right practices and you use good products and keep you all clean, they all do good. Okay. Uh, uh, fuel. So you mentioned uh, fuel, mm -hmm. and I, one of the other things that comes up on the forums a lot in in Europe, they're they're adding ethanol to the fuels now, and they're wasn't as much of that before. It's mostly yes. the U.S. kind of started that. Yep. And there's a lot of complaints. So, oh, your car will explode if you use that. Now, I've been using just E10. That's what's available at the pump mm -hmm. in, in the Triumphs forever. That's all we've, I've had. Yes. Uh, now, I know a few things. I know ethanol burns a little bit slower than pure gasoline. So you advance the timing because the spark's going to have to start a little bit sooner. Um, and then I know not to let it sit because it could separate out. But outside of those things, is ethanol fuel really bad for classic cars? It's bad for carburetors. Okay. Yeah, so any kind of ethanol in the fuel is going to increase corrosion in carburetors. So that's why it's important to run some kind of fuel additive, some kind of storage protection additive, uh, if you have classic cars that are going to sit with ethanol blended fuel. Okay. Um, if, just it's, if it's not sitting though, is that minimal? Uh, yeah, the, the more you drive it, the better off you're going to be. It sounds like you drive your car, cars a lot, which is good, which probably means the reason why you have let fewer issues. Um, but long-term storage where the fuel ha has a chance to sit and suck in more moisture, because obviously when you're driving all the time, you're consuming fuel and you're adding fresh fuel in that doesn't have as much moisture in it. When it sits, it can sit there and breathe out of the atmosphere and can suck in more moisture. Uh, so, because ethanol is hygroscopic. It will absorb atmospheric moisture. And people will say, well, ethanol is not corrosive. Well, anhydrous ethanol is not corrosive. Right. But anhydrous ethanol is kind of like a, a unicorn. It, yeah, yeah it, it, it might exist somewhere in the universe, but not really. So it's not the ethanol so much as the water that it absorbs. The mixture of the two. I see. The mixture of the two is corrosive. And it will damage fuel even in the ASTM fuel document it says you know oxidants in fuel like ethanol can corrode 
fuel system metals such as copper, magnesium, aluminum, and zinc. But we don't have a test method to determine that, so we can't evaluate it. Which, by the way, this is the same reason you want to flush your brake fluid periodically, because traditional brake fluid, dot three, dot four, that sucks in water. Correct, yep. and that's also corrosive and could lead to a number of problems. Mm -hmm. uh, I use silicon fluid in, in our cars, but, um, yep. but I guess it depends on where the brake master is. But. Yeah, so that, it, with <clears throat> classic cars, if you can give it a steady diet of non-ethanol fuel, that is the best thing for it, but that's increasingly difficult to do, sometimes not practical. So in the absence of that, it's good to drive it more often. That's better. And then number two, you use some type of ethanol fuel additive in it to help prevent corrosion and, and damage to your carburetor. And is that additive typically for storage or are there additives that you should be adding in? Usually they're, usually they're specific for ethanol blended fuels that have, like, so one of the ones you can get pretty easily is the um, Chevron Tecron Marine formula. So the Marine formulas are the ones that are, that are, are designed to prevent corrosion because this is obviously a much bigger issue in the marine industry than any other ones because they've got E10 fuel as well and they're in a highly <laughs> right, right. <laughs> water rich environment and so they, they had this problem right off the go so you can usually go uh, if they don't have it at the auto parts store if there's like a marine uh, you know a boat place near you you can probably go in there and they'll have a shelf full of stuff that's marine specific ethanol fuel type additives they'll do a good job anything else you'd like people to know well the great thing as i said earlier is that we're in a great day age today that we have really great off-the-shelf oils that can do a good job we have fuel additives that we can use that do a great job so that these classic cars we can it's easier today to keep them alive with stuff that is readily available. We have the ability to you know, test the oil and things like this to make sure that these things keep running and we enjoy them for decades to come because these things will outlive all the modern EVs. <laughs> right. you know? and, and, that's, and that's great because it's going to be easy to do that because we have so much better products today than we had 20 years ago. The biggest message is just get your calibration on today we have products today that can take care of these cars to keep them running you don't have to rely on speculation of how to do this from 15 or 20 years ago because things have changed you don't need to try to do the stuff they told you to do 20 years ago in terms of fuel and oil and additives and stuff to keep these cars running there's a whole new set of things that are available in the last five years that can do a great job. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, oh, uh, one other question. Uh, do you have a recommended brand of blinker fluid? <laughs> that one right there. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, anybody that hasn't seen it here, I've, I found this on Amazon. I bought some blinker fluid, so I'll, I'll probably market it and sell it, I guess. But uh, yeah. That's good stuff right there. Yeah. Yeah. You need to make sure that your, your blinkers are filled. It's good for a few thousand blinks. Anyway. Yeah. Like, thank you very much. I appreciate the time you spent. Uh, it's great talking to you, and then uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Sounds good. All right. Take care.